Hi everybody, today we're going to take an in-depth look at rugby balls. Without question, the ball is the most important piece of equipment in the game. There's not a kick, scrummage, ruck, or try that can happen without one. But not all rugby balls are created equal, and you'll need the right ball for the right task. In this guide, we'll examine the finer points of rugby ball design, as well as specialty rugby balls to help you pick that right ball for that right occasion. Key factors to consider when picking a rugby ball are the size and shape, grip, panel construction, bladder, valve placement, and the quality type. Let's look at the size and shape. Rugby balls come in a number of sizes, typically ranging from size 5 down to size 3. Size 5 balls are the official size used by both men's and women's teams in senior international competitions, The size 3 and 4 balls designed for youth rugby. World Rugby requires that the official size 5 rugby ball be oval and made of four panels that are made out of a leather or a suitable synthetic material. There are variations between official ball sizes, however, as World Rugby allows slight variations in the sizing. So some can be more pointed, fatter, narrower, etc. Check out our written ball guide for detailed specifications and measurements. In terms of shape, the circumference of the ball and the roundness of the ends play a huge part in the performance of the ball. In general, the rounder or thicker the ball is, the easier it is to kick, but the more difficult it is to pass out of hand. Conversely, the narrower and more pointed the ball gets, the better it is for passing out of hand, but the more difficult it is to kick. Now let's talk about the grip. The textured, pimpled outer layer provides players with a solid grip on the ball. The spacing, shape, and depth of these pimples determines to a large extent how the ball performs. The grip is carefully considered a balance between how easy a ball is to catch versus how far it can be passed or kicked. A higher pimple will generally give more grip but reduce kicking distance by increasing the drag. The grip pattern can also affect how long the grip will remain on the ball. Lower profile, rounder pimples will last longer than higher angular pimples, but they'll give less grip. This is why you'll see different grip types for different types of rugby, as the passing and kicking needs of 15s is different from 7s and is even more different than touch rugby. The type of rubber used to make the ball also affects the grip. Natural rubber provides more grip than synthetic rubber, but isn't as durable. That's why match balls will generally have a higher ratio of natural rubber to synthetic rubber to provide better grip. Training balls, on the other hand, will have a higher ratio of synthetic rubber to handle more wear and tear. Now let's look at panel construction. The construction of the panels affects the shape, retention, weight, and energy transfer properties of the balls. This isn't a minor consideration. Typically, a panel consists of an outer layer which has the rubber and grip, and a number of layers or plies between the outer layer and the bladder. Match balls are generally always constructed with three plies, while training balls can be two or three ply. A three ply ball will weigh more and be less affected by wind than a two ply, making the three ply ball more ideal for kicking and long passes. Also, a three-ply ball will generally hold its shape better. The material used in the ply construction can also affect the ball response to being kicked, especially in regard to how the energy is transferred into the bladder. You'll typically see three main types of materials used in the construction of the plies or layers below the outer cover. Cotton laminate, polycotton laminate, or a polyester or synthetic laminate. Cotton plies are not as effective as synthetics for maximizing kicking power. They absorb more energy than synthetic, so they transfer less of your kicking power into the bladder. Cotton plies are cheaper, though, than the synthetic ones, so they tend to be used more in construction of lower quality balls. The very best match balls have full synthetic ply construction, using special energy transferring materials to increase kicking distances. Keep in mind, no matter how many or what type of plies are used in a rugby ball, it's important that it be stored properly out of extreme hot or cold temperatures and weather. If a rugby ball isn't properly stored, is consistently overinflated or sat on, the ball shape can be affected over time. Now for the bladder. The bladder is probably the most vital component in determining how a rugby ball performs. Bladders are available in different materials and sizes depending on the intended use. Traditionally, match and training balls use a natural latex bladder, which has a high resilience and a great rebound characteristic. The downside of a natural latex bladder is that the surface is permeable and allows air to pass through over time. This means the ball needs to be reinflated about once a week. Butyl bladders are another option to natural latex that are less permeable to air. This material is typically found in mid to upper range balls. Uh, it's a really nice balance between the springiness of natural latex and the air retention qualities of a full synthetic. 
There are now advanced copolymers, primarily pioneered by Gilbert, that have all the natural springiness of natural latex, but are fully impermeable to air loss. So they can actually stay inflated for up to one to two months. Now for the valve placement. The valve obviously provides the means to inflate a rugby ball, but it also plays a key part in how the ball performs. Because the valve adds a weight to one side of the ball only, it can create an imbalance. This imbalance can detract from the performance or actually enhance the ball's performance. If the valve is placed in a, and constructed in an ideal position as it is on a match ball in the seam, it can actually tighten up the spin of the ball and improve its kicking and passing capabilities. When compared to a match ball, lower quality training balls tend to have the valve placed onto the side panel of the ball, which can offset the spin a little bit and then decrease the, uh, the power and rotation of the ball. When researching rugby balls, you'll sometimes see the designation, particularly on high-end match balls, that a ball has been pre-kicked. While this may seem excessive, the process can actually help the ball find its correct shape after inflation quicker than a ball that hasn't been pre-kicked. This can also help reveal any defects in manufacturing and provide yet another advantage to a premium match ball over other lower quality rugby balls. Now let's consider various quality types. You'll often see a ball labeled as a match ball or a training ball, but what does that actually mean? Because match balls are designed for less frequent but more important usage, they're built for maximum performance as opposed to low cost and durability. They usually feature more natural rubber for improved grip, valves placed in the seams of the ball to improve spin and flight, more synthetic ply construction materials, and special internal bladders to further increase the trueness of flight and the distance. There's a spectrum of match ball quality, starting with those that are just a cut above training balls to those that are of international quality. But you're not playing high level matches multiple times a week, so training rugby balls can be a very cost effective option for practices in low level gameplay or as an entry point for new players. They're designed with cost and durability in mind rather than maximum short term performance. Training balls tend to be made with synthetic rubber, which makes them resilient but also have less grip compared with match balls that use more natural rubber. They also tend to have their valve on the panel as opposed to inside the seam as match balls do. This can cause training rugby balls to not spin or kick quite as true as a match ball. Training balls will also usually have plies constructed with more cotton materials, which can lower kicking distances. Although there are some drawbacks with training balls, these factors are not as important for practices where simply having enough balls is more important than having a few extremely high performance balls. Sometimes different circumstances in training requires specialization that a standard ball can't offer. This is where specialty balls come in. There are a wide array of them, but let's take a look at some of the more popular and exotic ones. Sevens rugby balls are designed to maximize passing and catching performance, given the relatively small amount of kicking done, as compared to 15s. As a result, the grip on sevens rugby balls is usually very aggressive, with high angular dots, and the ball has a slightly narrower, more torpedo-like shape. This makes the ball easier to handle, but slightly more difficult to kick. There are women-specific rugby balls that bridge the gap between a size 4 and 5, using a 4.5 instead. While this isn't legal for competition play, they're meant to help improve skill development for younger women in particular, as they tend to have smaller hands than their male counterparts, and this can hinder your handling. This is a contentious issue though, and not everyone agrees this is a good idea or even a valid idea. Touch rugby balls are designed to have maximum grip and be as easy to pass as possible, because kicking in official touch rugby isn't allowed with the exception of the tap. They're just a bit above a size 4 in dimensions, making them far easier to handle than a standard rugby ball. Touch rugby balls should not be used in standard rugby competitions unless size 4 balls are allowed though. Beach rugby balls have a slightly soft, squishy surface designed to function properly even while wet and covered in sand. Because of this, they make excellent balls for young children in PE classes. Since they're much softer than standard rubber balls, they can be less intimidating, easier to catch, and potentially cause less pain or injury if a child were to get hit in the head or face. Weighted rugby balls usually weigh in at around 2.2 pounds or 1 kilogram. The extra weight can help develop the specific muscles involved in passing and force you to use a more efficient and technically sound pass as you can't muscle the ball out. It's important to note, these should never be kicked, however, as they can cause serious harm to your foot and ankle. Rebounder balls are effectively half rugby balls that still have the same weight as a standard ball. That lets you replicate the same passing mechanics as a regular ball without the need for a partner. These are excellent for individual skill work and developing your pass as you can easily get hundreds of reps in a session. They work well for a standard spin pass, line out throws, and even end on end kicks. Giant promo balls have absolutely no practical purpose in play, but can be a great way to promote your team or grab attention at recruiting events. 
So there you have it, a boatload of details about picking a rugby ball. We have a written version of this guide on worldrugbyshop.com for reference. We hope that helps answer any questions you might have, but if not, let us know and we'd be happy to help.